We are in our third week in our series through the Ten Commandments, and so Exodus chapter 20 is where uh, we will be this morning. Um, I can remember the first time in my life, uh, I think I was, I don't remember exactly when, but I know I was a child, but I remember the event, um, the first time I saw like an honest to goodness actual idol, uh, like a, a carved image. Um, we lived in Ottawa and, and I went with my dad to pick up some food that we had ordered and we went into an Indian restaurant. I remember going in and on a table just kind of off to the side there was this golden statue. I don't remember what it looked like but it was this golden statue and all these, all these trinkets around it and plants and things and then in front of this golden statue was a plate of food that was just sitting there. And I remember as a kid just looking at it and being like what on earth is that? And then we got back in the car and I asked my dad, dad, did you see that thing? Like, what was that? And he said, well, actually that's, uh, that's their God. That's who they think their God is. And then he said, did you see the plate of food in front of it? Interesting. That was like a sacrifice to their, their God that they worshiped. And I, re I remember just being fascinated by that being like, really? Wow. So interesting. Um, Fast forward a little bit, but still, you know, probably almost 15 years ago, my two sisters and uh, my brother-in-law went on this kind of month-long trip to Thailand and Vietnam, and they would send lots of pictures. And uh, one of the, the things that they did a lot of is that they would go and visit these different temple ruins, which were just really fascinating and beautiful. And then their, their tour guides would say, okay, and here is a statue of such and such a deity. This is who they used to worship. And then they would go to the next. So I saw all these pictures sent to me of different, you know, stone carvings of different looking kind of idols and images like that. And it was just fascinating, again, being like, huh, wow, interesting. Um, a few years ago, I had a friend that went uh, to Mexico and decided to visit a Catholic church in Mexico because it was one of those just like really beautiful, ornate buildings that just is just gorgeous, but he just kind of went as a visitor to see, okay, what, what goes on down here? And he noticed that as he went into this Catholic church, everyone who came in went up to the front and bowed down to a statue of Jesus and kissed Jesus' feet and then went and sat down in the, the pews. Um, all three of those examples are examples of idol worship. Um, it's interesting, even in the Bible in Acts chapter 17, you might know the story, but Paul is walking around in Athens and he says that, uh, or rather Luke tells us that Paul noticed that the city was full of idols because really, I, I don't think that's an exaggeration because in the ancient world, there was just idols everywhere. And so you would have an idol for this God and an idol for this God, a statue for this God, a temple for this God. And we're told that Paul walked around in Athens and he just noticed that this city is just crammed full of all of these images and idols. And we're told that his spirit was provoked when he saw all of these different idols. Now, you may have guessed what we're talking about this morning. <laughs> Uh, we're we're going to be uh, unpacking the second commandment, which tells us that we are not to make carved images or likenesses. Or, um, if you read it in the King James, thou shalt not make any raven images, right? Which just sounds way cooler. Um, I read that to my wife and kids, and they were like, whoa, man, what does that even mean? But the idea of no idols, no images, no likenesses... And on surface level, when we read the second commandment, I think sometimes we read it and go, isn't that the exact same as last week? Last week's commandment, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. And this week he says, well, don't make any idols or images uh, and, and worship them. And on surface level, we go, that sounds like the same thing. But I think there's actually a, a, a deeper level in the second commandment that sometimes we miss. And so what we want to do is, approach this second commandment this morning by asking a lot of questions. This might feel kind of like a Bible study as we just ask questions about what this command is and how do we obey and things like that. And so we want to actually kind of break it into four sections. We want to know, well, what, what this command isn't, that's important. What, what, what is this command not? Uh, and then what is God prohibiting in this command and why is he prohibiting it? What does this reveal about God 
And then how do you and I obey this commandment? So just asking some questions and trying to understand. So Exodus 20, let's read verses 4 to 6. It says this, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So right out of the gate, we, we want to ask, well, what, what is God not saying here? What this command isn't, okay, that's really important because I think a lot of times we're just like, uh, okay, well, we're not allowed to make anything about anything related to God. And so what this command isn't is God is not prohibiting art or beauty or creativity. God is not against those things. The second commandment is not saying you must not do any artistic things, and here's why, if you read in the Old Testament, uh, the, the, the commandments that God gave concerning the tabernacle and the temple, there are ornate decorations and carvings and symbols, all instructions given by God. I want you to do this. I want it to look like this. I want you to sew tapestries that look like this. And all given by God. Even the Ark of the Covenant that held the Ten Commandments and other artifacts were told that there were two gold cherubim angelic beings on top of the ark of the of the covenant covered in gold so it's not as if god is saying you know all your churches are just gray walls with no decorations that's not what he's saying um even in exodus 31 verses 2 to 5 you'll read this god says see i have called by name bezalel the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for settings, and in carving wood to work in every craft. So notice, God says, I have put my spirit in this man named Bezalel for the specific purposes that he would create carvings and stone and silver and bronze and artistic designs. So we just got to be clear that God is not prohibiting. You must never create anything that is artistic or beautiful or creative. Now, I, the reason I say that is that I think there's some Christians that actually believe that. We cannot have paintings or pictures or anything. Um, as a pastor, you get to meet lots of interesting people. Don knows this, but sometimes people will just come into the church and be like, I have a complaint to make. And I'm like, great, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> But uh, I re not recently, a few years ago, I had a guy come in and he's, he, uh, he didn't attend here, but he came in and said, you have a cross outside on the front of your building. That is the worship of a graven image. You have a cross on your stage. That is not allowed. No depictions of anything. That's not what this command is saying. It's not uh, decorations and beautiful things are allowed and actually prescribed by God in Scripture. So if you, you know, wear a cross on a necklace around your neck, that is not idol worship. So then the question is, well, what exactly is God prohibiting in this second commandment and why? Both questions are very important. What is he saying? Okay, don't do this. And why is he saying that? I think there's actually two things that God is prohibiting when he gives us this second commandment. The first is similar to last week. God is saying, well, just don't worship other things. Um, the Hebrew word for image uh, comes from the verb, which means to carve out of wood or to make craft something out of iron. Basically, it's crafting like a physical idol that you would bow down and worship. And the temptation was to create an idol, something that I can see, right? And then have that be our God. And like all the other cultures in the ancient world did this. The Persians worshiped 
the stars and the moon and the sun. And so they would have different images and idols of those things that they would then set up in their temples. And here is our God, a a carving of a sun. That's the God that we worship. Um, The Babylonians worshipped or used a lot of carved images of um, fish or sea monsters, and then they would carve those things or make them out of metal, and they would say, here, here's your God. The Egyptians and the Greeks, they worshipped and carved a lot of animals and birds. Basically, it was like images of all of these created things from the created world. Let's carve, make an idol out of that, and then we'll worship that thing. And so what God is saying is, don't worship other gods. So why though? Why no idols specifically? Well, like I said, really last week said, well, th- those things don't exist. The reason you shouldn't worship an idol is because there's no such thing. You can create uh, an idol to say, we're going to worship Baal or Molech or Artemis or Asherah. Yet yeah, those things don't exist. So why shouldn't I worship an idol? Because they're not real. And then secondly, why shouldn't you worship an idol? Because it's stupid. Can I say that? The biblical word would be, it is folly. It is foolishness. But in our vernacular, it's just dumb. I'll give you, I'll give you a passage that says this. Isaiah 44. Um, you can flip there if you have it. It'll be on the screen as well. But in, in Isaiah 44, there's this whole section of Scripture, verses 9 to 20. We'll read part of it. Where Isaiah is going into how silly it is to worship a carved image. Um, He says this in verse 14, speaking of a man who would kind of create these images, he cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me for you are my god. They know not, nor do they discern. For he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they do not understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? So do you see what he's saying? I'm going to cut down one tree And I'm going to use half of it to make a fire and cook my food and warm myself. And then I'll use the other half of the same tree and say, this is my God. Foolishness. Like the same tree. You're worshiping half of the tree and then you're burning the other half of the tree. Doesn't make a lot of sense. I'll give you another example. We read it as our call to worship. But Psalm 115, uh, it says, why? Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. And then here's the foolishness of worshiping idols. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. Do you, do you see the silliness of it? I'm going to make something with human hands and then say, oh, this is God. And you could carve a really beautiful, ornate statue of a, of a person that has really detailed features of eyes and a mouth. But can that hunk of wood speak? Can it actually see? You can carve a a statue that has hands, but can those hands actually move and feel things? It may have feet on your statue, but can that statue actually move around and walk? No, it's a piece of wood. See, the reason that we should not worship idols or, or images is because it's just foolishness. When you think logically, it just doesn't make any sense. 
Now, um, some historians have uh, called what we do often chronological snobbery. A lot of times us in the 21st century, we look back at ancient cultures and we go, oh, those silly superstitious people, right? They carved wooden things. That's so silly and we would never do things like that. We don't worship idols. We're much more scientific. We're smarter than they were, right? We don't have idol worship, which is just uh, patently untrue. And we worship all sorts of idols. Um, In the ancient world, there was a god that they worshiped named Molech. And part of worship of Molech is uh, parents would come and bring their children and then kill their children in worship to Molech. And we look at that and we go, that's horrendous. And yet in Canada, since 2005, there have been 1.5, over 1.5 million babies murdered by their parents. So we worship idols. I'm going to offer up this child that I don't want. Um, In the ancient world, they worshiped a god named Aphrodite, who was the god of sex and pleasure. And you would go to the temple and participate with temple prostitutes and part of the worship of Aphrodite. And in our day and age, we spend billions upon billions of dollars on porn and every manner of sexual immorality. So we still worship idols. So, so don't be a chronological snob and look back at ancient cultures and go, I'm so much more refined and civilized than they are. You worship idols as well. And not even that, uh, I think sometimes our idols in our day and age are a little bit more insidious because uh, we uh, have idols in our hearts. But even in the Old Testament, it talked about that. Ezekiel 14, 3, it says, son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. So even in the ancient world, there was a tendency, yeah, I'm going to go to the temple and worship this physical carved image, but also they would take their idols, the different gods that they worshipped, and they would have them in their own hearts. That is much more like us today. I think the idols that we worship are a lot more insidious and hard to spot because we don't. We, we don't have, you know, in Fort St. John, we don't walk around the streets and see all of these actual physical idols and temples that I can go into and bow down to an actual physical statue of a God. But we have so many idols. And mainly, I think that they're, they're idols that exist in our, our hearts, So the first thing that God is prohibiting in this second command is do not bow down to these idols. Don't worship other things besides the one true God. But there's a second aspect that I think this command is talking about. And it's this, we not only ruin our lives by worshiping the wrong gods, we also ruin our lives by worshiping the right God, but in a wrong way. I think what this second commandment is saying is, God is prohibiting us from self-willed worship. I'm going to worship God any way that I choose rather than how God has prescribed for us. And so what God is saying is, yeah, don't make images or idols of false gods and bow down to them. But also, don't make images or idols to represent the true God in any form. So let me just, again, remind you, God's not against art or beauty. What he's against is infusing any object with spiritual efficacy, meaning this man-made object or artifact or whatever it is, that thing is going to bring me closer to the true God. This thing will represent God, or if I, uh, if I do certain things with this object or, or whatever, it will establish communion with God. Let me give you a few examples of how the Israelites did that. Not just idol worship of Baal or Molech or Asherah, but actually saying we're going to create images and idols to help our worship of Yahweh. So Exodus 32, if you want to flip over a few places, um, the story of the golden calf, I think lots of us read this story and go, oh, they created a golden calf to represent a false god that they worship. That's not actually 100% accurate. They created a golden calf to say, we're going to help worship Yahweh through the golden calf. 
So look, this is what it says. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. Oh man, poor Moses, right? As a, who's this Moses guy? We don't know what happened to him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. To who? To Yahweh. And they rose up early the next day and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Notice what they didn't do. We created a golden ha- a calf. This is Kaffi, our new God. They said, hey, here's the God that brought us from Egypt. We've made an image of him. And Aaron said, tomorrow we're gonna have a huge feast for who? For Yahweh. So notice what they're doing. Give us something to look at so that we can worship. Um, This continues um, even many, many, many years later. King Jeroboam in the north kingdom, once Israel had split into two kingdoms in 1 Kings 12, he said, you know what? We don't need to go to Jerusalem to worship God. I'm going to create two golden calves and we can just worship Yahweh up here. So notice, they're not necessarily worshiping a different God. They're saying, let's help our worship of the true God by making an image, an idol, something. Let me give you another example. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, um, Israel does a similar thing. It says this in verse 1, Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts who was enthroned on the cherubim and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were there um, with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Okay, so do you get the plan? Man, we're being destroyed. We need something. Ah, go get the Ark. Bring that into the camp. Maybe it will save us. So here's what happens. Verse five, as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid. And they said, a God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for nothing like this is has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So like so far, it sounds good, right? The Philistines are scared. Maybe this will work. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. Wait a second. And they fled, every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter for 30,000 foot foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas died. And you go, what happened? Didn't this sound like a good idea? Do you know what happened? The Israelites were treating the ark as a good luck charm. Hey, if we just bring that image, that thing that we have, bring it into the camp, and then God has to do what we want. So what God is prohibiting in this second commandment, besides don't just worship other gods, he's saying don't try and make images or idols that will try, that you're trying to help your worship of Yahweh. 
Um, Brevard Childs, a scholar, says this. This is why images are prohibited. He says, images are prohibited because they are an incorrect response to God's manner of making himself known, which was by means of his word. You'll notice that every time God um, appears in the Old Testament, um, it, it, it varies, right? He comes and, he, and Moses sees a burning bush. The Israelites, all they see is thunderclouds and lightning and storms on the top of Mount Sinai. Um, he, he, God primarily reveals himself through his word, right? Even... Even when you get to the book of Revelation, it's so fascinating. John sees visions of God, but all the descriptions are, it was like this, it was like that, it was like that. The throne had the appearance of something like that. There's no definitive, this is what God looks like in the book of Revelation. It was kind of like this, it was like this, and then I saw this thing. Why? Because God primarily reveals himself through his word. So we can't image the true God as something lower than he is, right? I'm gonna take something from creation, something that God has created, and I'm gonna use that to represent God. You can't do that because then you're bringing the almighty, all-powerful God down to the level of his creation. And he's so much bigger than that. Even in Deuteronomy 4, Moses tells the Israelites, when you heard God give the 10 words to you, you didn't see any form. All you heard was a voice, and then in verse 15, Moses says, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Since you saw no form on that day when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself. So do you see what Moses is saying? The tendency will be, I heard the words of God. I heard God. I'm going to make something that represents him. And Moses says, oh, watch yourself very carefully that you don't do that. So why? Why does God prohibit the use of images? Well, a few reasons. One, it puts God in a box. Here is what God looks like to me. I'm going to create this thing that helps me worship God. It, images taken from creation limit God and it localizes him. God's presence is only here with this thing, right? Even think of John 4, Jesus with the Samaritan woman. She says, you know, we worship on this mountain, but there's people that say you have to go to Jerusalem to worship. And what does Jesus say? An hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship. So don't localize God. You must use this thing or come to this location to worship God. You're, you're localizing him. And then perhaps the most dangerous is inevitably images that you use to worship Yahweh will inevitably lead you astray and become a substitute for the real God. It inevitably happens. Well, I'm just using this item to worship the true God. Give it enough time, that item will become your God. Um, even, I'll give you an example. Numbers 21, if you know the story, the Israelites are complaining, which they do a lot. They're complaining, and God sends serpents to bite them as punishment. And then uh, they're crying out to God, and God says to Moses, okay, get a pole and just make a bronze serpent and hold the bronze serpent up. And everyone who looks at the bronze serpent, they will live, they won't die. God just shows an incredible act of mercy to his people. Look at this thing. Do you know that the Israelites began to worship the snake on the pole? 2 Kings 18 Years later, talking about a king that was, I got to get rid of idol worship. He, he says he removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. So listen, your intentions might be good. I'm just using this thing to help worship God. Inevitably, you will begin to worship that thing. This is why God says, don't make any images. Because no, no image will ever capture the fullness of our transcendent, all-powerful God. Now, what does this command reveal about God then? 
And looking at specifically verse 5 and 6, it reveals a few things. First of all, our God is a jealous God. The second half of verse 5 says, For I, the Lord your your God, am a jealous God. So the God that we serve is a jealous God. But when I use that word jealous, it doesn't mean suspicious or distrustful or wrongly envious. It's not the same as like, okay, my neighbor got a new vehicle and I look out my window and go, I'm so jealous that he got that and I didn't. That's not the jealousy that God's talking about. Um, It would be more so the example of a husband who is jealous for his wife, which we would go, he should be. Right, I used that example last week, but if, if my wife was like, I'm just going to go and be in relationships with all these other men, I should be extremely jealous for her. I would be a lousy husband if I was like, yeah, that's fine. Go and have all these other relationships with all these other men. You would look at that and go, Andrew, you're a terrible husband. Why? Husbands should be jealous for their wives. That's what this verse is saying. It's saying God demands exclusive devotion. He's supreme. He will not and cannot share in his glory. Even a sincere attempt to represent him will fail. He is too glorious. So our God is a jealous God. The second thing we learn about God from this command is that our God is a just God. We're told if we continue in verse 5 that he's visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. This is not describing generational curses. This is not describing some kind of hex that is on family lines. Biblically, those things don't exist. There is no such thing as a generational hex or curse. Even though it's very popular in our day and age in certain circles of Christianity, and we have to break that generational curse. Your grandfather was this, and so now you are this by no control of yourself, and you have to break that curse. That doesn't exist. That's not what this is saying. The reason I know that is that there's many other places that say the opposite of what this is saying. So, for instance, Ezekiel 18.20, the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So there's no such thing biblically as, okay, my dad did this, and now I'm paying for his sin. No, he pays for his own sin. So then, what is this verse saying? Because that's kind of what it sounds like. Right? God's going to punish the children of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Surface level, doesn't it mean that, you know, my great-grandfather did this, and so, you know, generations later, now I, through no fault of my own, I'm suffering from this. That's not what this is saying. What this verse is saying, it is a, it is a warning to those who will continue to walk in the wicked ways of their parents. The reason I know this is that it says right there, to the third and fourth generation of who? Of those who hate me. It's not that, oh, my dad did that, and now, oh, woe is me. No, it's that I hate God just like my dad did. Children often repeat the sins of their fathers. This is all this verse is saying. And they will be punished like their fathers. Why? Because God is just. He, he won't let sin go unpunished. We, we serve a, a very just God. And then the third thing is that this teaches us that we also serve a gracious God. Verse 6, in comparison, says, but he's going to show steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Um, Some of your translations say a steadfast love to thousands of generations. Like, what a gracious God we serve that he's going to show steadfast love for those who love him. So then the last question, just very practically, okay, well, how do you and I obey, right? 2024, Fort St. John, how do we obey a commandment like this? And like I said, I don't, I don't think if I went to your houses and spied on you that you have some kind of carved image on your kitchen counter that you bow down and worship. I would highly doubt that. But how do we worship, or rather, how do we obey a command like this? Of not making carved images or likenesses. How do we actually obey God? Well, a few things. Number one, just don't worship other things. 
realize the foolishness, the absurdity of worshiping a created thing. And then replace the idols that exist in your heart with the truth of the gospel. Just, just think logically about the silly things that we worship. I'm going to worship money, this, these pieces of paper. I'm going to put all my heart and all my soul into having as much money as I can. And then guess what? You die and you don't take any of it with you. Well, he died and he had $5 million in his bank account. Still dead. Right? But we, I'm going to spend my whole life chasing after money, 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 money. Do you realize how foolish that is? I mean, we could just go on and on. We talked about worshiping beauty or sex or power. It's just silliness to say, I'm going to put all my heart in worshiping these things that will just fade. But it's not enough to just um, pull up the idols in our hearts because they inevitably grow back. Um, Jonathan Edwards talked about the expulsive power of a greater affection. So when you pull up the idol of money in your heart, you must plant the truth of the gospel there so that it doesn't grow back. So you pull out this need, I must have money, and you pull it out, and then you read scripture where it says, hey, you are infinitely rich in Jesus. So plant that there. I have everything I need. I am spiritually rich because Jesus became poor. I don't need Money, right? So pull the idol out and then plant the truth of the gospel. So how do we obey? Just don't worship other things. Secondly, how do we obey this? You must be on guard against using images of God, both external and imaginative. You must, you must guard against, I'm going to use these icons or images or things to help focus my worship of Jesus. I gave the example last night. I think this, the rosary that Catholics use to pray is one of these graven images. If I just hold these beads and if I pray them in a certain way, then my prayers are more effective. That's exactly what the second commandment is saying. Don't worship God through these things. I think a phrase that none of us should ever say is, well, to me, God is like this. Because it doesn't matter to you who is God revealed in his word. So be very careful where you go, well, I just feel like to me, God is kind of like this. Uh, you, you could be very dangerously close to breaking the second commandment where you're creating an image of him that's actually not true. So, for example, imagine, imagine if someone came to me and said, okay, Andrew, I want to write a biography about you. This is never going to happen, by the way, but imagine. And they said, but in my biography, I'm going to write that you're an Olympic athlete, that you were an introvert, that you don't really like engaging with other people, and that you had a bunch of fish and birds as pets. And I would go, well, I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm honored that you want to write a biography about me, but that's, that's not, none of those things are true. And the person could say, yeah, but you know what? In my biography, that's how I desire to see you. Right? But we do the same thing with God. I just feel like God is like this. I just feel like he's this. When it could be actually the opposite of what he said in his word, what, what are we doing in that moment? We're creating images of God that we're worshiping. I'll give you a few examples. Years ago in a very popular church in the United States, they had some kind of conference thing and there was a clip that went kind of viral and there was a, a woman on stage talking uh, about the Holy Spirit and she said something along the lines of, for me, I picture the Holy Spirit like the genie from Aladdin. And he's just really fun and he's funny and he's my friend. And I watched that and laughed at it because one, it's just ridiculous but two, what's happening in this moment? I'm creating an image of God that helps me in my worship of him. You're breaking the second commandment. There was another clip that I watched, and it was a pastor, and he was talking about, you know, one time we were worshiping. I can't remember if he said he just imagined this or he claimed that he had a vision, but, you know, Jesus came to him and hugged him, and Jesus said, I'm sorry for all the times that I've hurt you. And you go, That's, that doesn't sound like the Jesus that has been revealed to us. I, I think he's worshiping a, an image of God that's not true. So I say all that. To, we have to be really on guard. 
right? It's easy for us to go, okay, well, we're not going to make a golden calf and say, this is Yahweh that we're worshiping. Of course not. But we do this all the time where we invent in our brains images of God or we, uh, right? I, I, I remember being here once in a worship night and a lady came up and she bowed down to the cross and kissed the cross. Don't. That's idol worship. Yes, have a cross, great. Reminds us of the death of Jesus, but we don't bow down and worship it. I had another time when uh, I had my Bible and I was in an event and I was gonna speak at an event and I just kind of put my Bible on the ground until it was ready and a guy came over and he said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You can't put your Bible on the ground. I'm like, you know we don't worship this, right? Maybe this has become like a graven image t- for you. I'll give you an example that some of you are not going to like, okay? So The Chosen, very popular show. There's lots great about that show, but I've actually seen Christians who are like, oh, it's so helped me in my relationship with God because now when I read the Gospels, I picture the actor who plays Jesus on The Chosen. I think this is why God says, Oh, watch yourselves very carefully. That we would not take images and say, this is helping me in my worship. No, we worship the invisible God who says, don't make images of me. And then lastly, okay, how do we relate to the invisible God then? Because if you're like me, it would be like, man, oh man, an image would be so helpful. Well, guess what? He's given us one. Colossians 1.15 says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Who's it speaking of? Jesus. Right? You're going to notice that all of these commandments find their fulfillment in Christ. In Exodus 20, God says, don't make for yourselves any images. Why? Because one's coming. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. 2 Corinthians 4.6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the glory or, or the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, how do we know about the light of the knowledge of the glory of God? Look to the image of Jesus. Jesus is the one image who does not limit God's glory. Jesus is the one image of God that won't lead you astray. He's the one image where you do meet God, and he's the one image who really and truly is God. So we don't need images. You and I, we look to the word and we read about who this Jesus is and he is the image, the exact image of God. And so we worship him and we look to him. So my prayer for all of us is that um, as we follow Jesus, we wouldn't have our hearts be pulled and tugged to other things, that we wouldn't worship other idols, that we would realize just the foolishness of idol worship, that we would uproot them, that we would plant the gospel. My prayer is that you and I would be very careful, that we would guard against using images of God, that we go, no, I don't need to have those things that quote unquote help my worship of him. And that thirdly, you and I would constantly look to Jesus. He is the image of our invisible God. And that we would worship and follow him. So Father, I just thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you are a God who has revealed himself through your word. Um, All throughout scripture, it talks about you come and you reveal who you are primarily through the words that you speak. Um, Even these 10 commandments, when you spoke them to the Israelites, they saw no image, no form. All they they heard was these, these words from your mouth, the voice of God. God, I pray that you would just forgive us when we are tempted to worship other idols, when our hearts get get drawn and pulled away into the worship of money or beauty or power or success or whatever it is, God. I, I, I pray that we would be vigilant in uprooting these idols in our hearts and planting the gospel deep instead. 
God, forgive us when we think that we can use images or things in our worship of you. Um, God, we are so often guilty of that. Where, if, hey, if I can just have this thing, if I can go to this location, if I can just do this, then that will help me meet with God. Um, God, forgive us when we break the second commandment. I, I pray that we would just look to the true and only image of you, God, which is the person of Jesus. God in the flesh that we would turn to your word and we would read and study who Jesus is and that he would be the one that we look to and worship rather than all of these other things. So just do your work in our hearts, God. We need your help to live this out and to obey it. And thank you that, God, you are just and you are gracious and you show steadfast love to thousands of generations of those who love and serve you. So just do your work in our hearts, God. And we pray this in your name. Amen.